So a couple couple things before I get started, just to Mike and the entire Make My Move team, thanks for this opportunity today. And it could we couldn't kick off the week any better. You know, racing for talent. The 500 is just a short six days a week, six days away from now. But as Mike mentioned, the governor, he's probably touched down by now, but coming back from Davos, representing the state of Indiana, we've got this event today. And, you know, just this morning, I think we also heard that the first uh, military cargo plane landed in Indianapolis with baby formula. So, I mean, the, the world keeps seeing the state of Indiana. And then I think all of us probably know that Thursday, Friday, the world is coming to the state of Indiana with the Global Economic uh, Summit. And then, you know, the state of Indiana in its normal way is throwing a party for 300,000 friends on Sunday at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So I, it couldn't be set up any better, Mike and team, uh, for this event today. So why are we here? And I was talking to someone earlier, and I, and I don't know if it was Mike or John or who it was, uh, but I just uh, made a couple notes that we really need to lean into this. Uh, we've got to make some bold moves, and we've, we need to do it now. You know, Melissa mentioned, what, 25% of the professional jobs will be remote by the end of the year. Uh, and if we're not working on this today or tomorrow, we're going to get left behind uh, in the dust, and we're not going to take that checkered flag as we should, and we should uh, do that every single time we go after it. Um, John mentioned that we should work together, whether it's calling up another peer or, you know, if you look at these five people that have done it before, you're going to hear from them about, you know, what's worked, you know, one thing they wish they would have known uh, if they were starting all over again or, you know, just a little bit about their program. But we're in this together. Uh, we need to be very transparent. I would say don't hesitate, hesitate to pick up the phone and call anyone, even John. Uh, but we're here to help, and we as a state can win together. So... Next thing, lessons learned, like I said, positive impact on your community and on the state. And, you know, being bold also means being loud. Uh, we are a very humble state, and we need to yell at the top of our lungs about the success. You know, Greensburg and their grandparent program, I mean, that hit the national news. There's a lot of these programs that have been lifted up and are really bringing a spotlight to the state of Indiana. So don't hesitate to do that. And I know the state is, you know, within the IDC, we're doing a lot uh, to really tell that story in a loud, uh, productive, concise, clear way. So with that, uh, I just, you know, I'm joined by an amazing, distinguished panel here. Uh, and I'll start off with the mayor of Greensburg, uh, mayor of Muncie, uh, Jeff Quile, who's the CEO of Radius Indiana, and if you don't know, Radius Indiana is a regional partnership representing eight counties in southwest central Indiana. And then Mr. Greg Deason, who's the senior vice president of alliances and placemaking. You should talk to Greg about the programs that they have with companies that are locating into the Purdue Research Park or the Discovery Park District, uh, but they're doing a lot of, I would say, concierge level of services to help those employers. And then Mr. Pat East, who uh, I had the opportunity to meet back in January and doing some amazing things as it relates to, you know, the co-working space, the mill. And he will also be sharing some of those things. And we heard a little bit about it, but I think Melissa brought it up. Stickiness. How do you get them hooked into the community and staying in the community? So with that, we're just going to kick off with a couple things. Uh, we're going to have about 10 minutes at the end for some Q&A, but let's just kick it right now, Pat, with... You know, could you, Pat's going to provide, and each one of the panelists are going to provide an overview of their program and how the program was funded. So, Pat, can you kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Pat East. I'm the executive director of The Mill in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, so, it's 19,000 square feet of co-working and incubator space. And so, as part of co-working, we decided to really lean into uh, remote worker recruitment. So, we started... Uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, June 2020 is when we launched the program. So, um, uh, you know, we're just under, no, excuse me, June 2021 is when we launched the program. So we started working on it at the beginning of the pandemic, launched about a year later. Um, and so, um, you know, right now we've got 30 commitments uh, of folks to move to Bloomington. Uh, within the last year, about 20 of those have already moved to Bloomington. So our initial goal was just 10. We said, hey, we would be, this would be a really big success if we figure out how to get 10 folks to move to Bloomington. 
And, uh, and so we once, as soon as we got that 10, then we just layered on some more and some more after that. Uh, we've recruited folks from uh, all four corners of the U.S. Uh, we've recruited folks from outside of the country. We've recruited CEOs, one of which has moved his company to, to Bloomington. Uh, so it's been a really, really tremendous program. The initial seed funding for the program came from the mill um, itself. So uh, our staff work on the program. We got some funding from the city of Bloomington as well. Um, we got a sponsorship from Century 21 for relocation services. So all the folks who come in uh, wanting, uh, wanting to know about Bloomington or wanting to relocate, uh, potentially buy a house, get funneled through Century 21. And then we also got some funding from uh, our, uh, our Elevate Regional Partnership called Velocities. Just one quick question, Jeff. Um, I recall that you're doing something to hook in these, you know, individuals that relocate to Bloomington. I, I thought there was something about you sit them on a board or what is that? Yeah, so the two big incentives we have um, are uh, one is they get a, a, a three-year membership at the mill. Uh, so the mill kind of looks like the Biltwell Center. It's a, it's a century old building. It's just a gorgeous space to work. So they get a, a co-working membership. And then also uh, we refer them to one of our local nonprofits who we already have a relationship with for a board observer seat. So this is a really great, um, cheap, and uh, no cost way to attract the right types of people that want to immediately start giving back to their home. Um, you know, also embeds them in the community so they quite literally start making friends. One of the things that we learned from the very first cohort um, through now the second cohort is um, the, the sexy part about this program is recruiting people here. That's what gets headlines. The meat and potatoes of the program is getting them to stay here. And so that's what we're really focusing on now and part of why we offer the, the board observer seat with a nonprofit. Thanks, Pat. Jeff? Well, I would start out by saying amen to what Pat said about building the support system around the people you recruit in. That is key. But um, Jeff Quile with Radius Indiana. Radius is an eight-county nonprofit regional economic development group. Uh, former Lieutenant Governor Becky Skillman was our previous uh, CEO, and she's now chairman of our board. Our eight counties together down in southwest central Indiana are a very rural region. We're atypical of regional economic development organizations in that sense. Um, our largest city has maybe 15,000 people. Total population in the eight counties is about 225,000. So about the equivalent of one-year townships here in Marion County, probably, uh, spread across eight counties. For our communities, obviously, population loss has been a long-term concern. Uh, six of our eight counties did record declines in population over the last census period. So we began looking for ways to try to reverse that, both for the sake of just civic uh, capacity as well as for workforce needs. And uh, that's what we concluded would be uh, the best reasons to tap into TMAP and, and uh, make my move. We talked to each of our eight counties. We said uh, Radius will offer a, a regional approach. If you want to come in and customize your approach to it, uh, feel free, we'll help provide uh, the yeoman's part of the support to run it. Five of our eight counties chose to step into the program. It's been, um, it's been very interesting. We've learned, uh, as Pat said, you offer the incentives and you get people to move in, but then you really have to think hard about how you build the support system around them, how you really build the sense of community so that you get them engaged in, in where they've chosen to move to. Uh, they've obviously uh, demonstrated that they're willing to move around. So if they move once, we hope they're not going to move again for a long time. Our program does provide a $5,000 incentive. Radius pays 3000 of that. And then the respective county that gets the person pays the other $2,000. Some of those counties use uh, local economic development organization dollars. One of them uses um, a community foundation funds. Uh, as another source, so there's, there's a mix of how they've found ways to provide their, mic, their uh, matching funds. So, Thank you. Greg? Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Greg Deason with Purdue. Um, in our case, we, we piloted this uh, program about a year ago, uh, and uh, af after some successful recruitment, what we call conversion of prospects to citizens, uh, we decided to scale the program, and uh, that is in, 
conjunction with Make My Move. Uh, of course, Purdue is a partner in that. The Greater Lafayette Community, City of West Lafayette, a partner in that. And the IEDC has been part of that. So uh, we've uh, been thrilled to be at 30 employees, or 30 people that have relocated, plus uh, their households. Uh, and we think we'll be at about 50 uh, this next year. I would say that the, the unique thing that is happening uh, in our environment, and, and probably just the X factor, if you're familiar with, with X factors, often a real estate term, is what is different about our location, and predominantly that's because of Purdue University. And so we've really leaned into that. Uh, there are many other things that are, are, are great about our community, um, quality of life type aspects, but what we've tried to do is to make them feel as if they are part of the Purdue family. Uh, and that means they've been given memberships in the Purdue Alumni Association. That means that they're able uh, to participate fully in the activities of the university. They've been given Wi-Fi access, library access, an ID card that allows them uh, to ride the city bus for free. Uh, and then a, a lot of what I would call in of one activities where we're trying to find the best ways to plug these individuals in. In our case, uh, a bit like what Pat described, we're finding people that predominantly have lived in large metro areas, coastal areas, and, and they're looking for a different quality of life equated to they want to be in an environment with, uh, with a lot of interesting things going on, but the cost factors and the hassle factors of moving around they don't want. And so um, this inclusion has been really interesting to us, I think, at first phase. We thought, well, why wouldn't they want to come to a place where there's, uh, you know, Division One sports and things like that? But what we're really finding is they really want to be embedded in our entrepreneurship community, which I've had a, a large hand in. And they also want to be involved in activities that stimulate their intellectual interests. So connecting them into departments, colleges of interest, and activities has been a big part of what we do to help them feel more a part of the Purdue family. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Mayor Reitenauer. So Muncie's situation, I suppose, is similar in, in a lot of ways. However, we are definitely not a growing community, have not been. We've gone 10 years in a row with uh, population decreases. Uh, and so as a first-term mayor, uh, when Luke Messer and Mike Retz, when they, when they came into my office, I told them immediately, I said, we're going to do this. At that point, I decided, I decided to use, rather than take any time, I know how desperately we need growth in Muncie. Uh, and so I looked at and used the mayor's edit funds uh, to fund this. I have it budgeted not only for last year when I first paid, but in 2022, uh, or 2023, and I budgeted 2022. And I have it budgeted, just to tell you, in 2024. I see this as a great opportunity, and I saw it at that time as a great opportunity. So what we put together, um, and we, we will continue to tweak it, but we knew that we have, we have a major university with Ball State University, um, and that was a big drawing card. Most of the people we've brought in, and our numbers are a, a little less than some, maybe a little more than others, we've had 10 commitments. Um, four have been able to find locations so far and have moved. Um, but they like the Ball State component. So we're certainly playing on that. They like having a major university which provides uh, not only athletic opportunities, but all types of art and cultural and, and other opportunities. And uh, I know we have, um, uh, so what we, what we did is we, do, we pay a $5,000 stipend uh, but we also like what Purdue is doing. They get uh, a membership that Ball State Library is on board. They get a membership to the Ball State um, rec facilities so they can use the, uh, the recreation facilities. Uh, they, get sport, they can go to sporting events and so forth. We also got them a membership to the Innovation Connector, which is um, one of our uh, areas just outside of downtown, right on the White River. It's a certified tech park. Um, and it provides them with the opportunity when they want to be able to go in and, and use the facility for meetings and so forth. Um, and uh, that is a place where we grow entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, 
you know, I'm also, we're going to steal some other ideas, and I hope you will as well. Uh, we did not add them to a board, but we thought that was a great idea. Um, and so th there are a lot of things that we can do, but our purpose was to build our wealth, and I'll say this, in, in the average income in Muncie, uh, we're the third, we have, I think that we have the third highest poverty rate in the state. Uh, and so I was looking for how can I come up with ways to increase our average income. And to know that so far the 10 that have committed to come here have an average wage of 95,500 in a community where the average wage is in the 40s, that's exactly what I was looking for. And so my economic development dollars will continue to go for this because not only is that one individual making on average double what our average citizen is making, but they're bringing a bonus partner. They're bringing a bonus spouse or a bonus uh, employee that we can then utilize for other opportunities in the city. For the most part, I think, I, I don't, I think we've only had one that was single. So many of them have partners and many of them have spouses and children. So we, we're really excited about this program and, and I would encourage all of you to take advantage of it. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm Mayor Joshua Marsh for the city of Greensburg and we're a little bit unique in a couple different ways. One, we're a small community of about 13,000 people in our city. Uh, Decatur County is about another 13,000. So we run about 25,000 citizens. Um, we are not a college town. We are well located geographically um, between Indianapolis, which is 50 minutes from this stool to my desk, 50 minutes uh, to Cincinnati as well, and we're within an hour and a half of the Louisville International Airport. So we have three world-class airports, three symphonies, three, mu three state museums, and everything that sort of are housed in those urban cores that are just an hour or so away. And so our pitch kind of became, and our relationship really is with the county, and Deanna Burkhart is a county councilwoman with me today has really been a joint effort. Um, we ran this program with edit dollars as well, the economic development income tax, through our existing economic development corporation, which is a separate 501c6, mostly funded by the county and the city jointly. So that's kind of the root of ours, but our emphasis was really on um, not necessarily stopping the, gro the growth rate or stopping the decline in population, we weren't experiencing that. We actually experienced small population growth. But it was really more about diversification of our income sources and employee and employer base. Um, we're obviously home to Honda Manufacturing of America, where uh, we have 2,500 plus associates that go in every day. We make a lot of auto parts um, in the city of Greensburg. But when you see trends that fall and, and ebb and flow like the auto industry or whatever, we really were focused on how do we maybe just get a few more different employers than we have. We don't have a blue chip company. We don't have a high tech company. We have some high tech manufacturing. But how do we get someone, um, and the quote is in the brochure today from one of our uh, residents that moved, that works at Amazon. And so now we have someone that works in our community that works for Amazon makes more than the average household, brought a bonus spouse who's really interested, and we heard it earlier, to open some type of childcare preschool facility. Perfect, because the need in the, one of the meetings with them was what kind of childcare or daycare facility do you have? And we said, well, they're all really full. Um, and they said, we'd be interested in starting one. So we are already seeing that benefit. Our goal when we started out was to have five families move, and, and uh, some have 50, some have 10, our goal was five, because who would have thought that a small community of 13 or 26,000 would be able to attract five people that would be interested, much less move there. Um, with TMAP's help and uh, some national publicity for our grandparents on demand, we attracted over 2,000 applicants for our program of five spots. Something that we're incredibly proud of and that we hope we can tap back into that. So really quickly, what was our incentive package since we were talking about it? There was $5,000 cash worth to help relocate, um, which some people thought was wasted money. We heard from uh, Ms. Messer earlier that that is actually a big factor in the moving of that. We also did several things, co-working space, privately owned membership donated, YMCA membership for a year, gift certificates to the farmer's market downtown, 
and then um, a seat at the table because we're really focused on that getting them invested in the community too. So these were tickets uh, for two people for each move to six or seven of the top events in the community per year that are kind of hard to get into. Um, and so we've got four of the five families on the ground. We took all four of them to the hospital gala, which is a big fundraising activity, introduced them to the community, made sure that they met the CEO of the hospital and got to talk about where they came from, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky. And so it's been really good to have that kind of investment um, to see, and we're really looking forward to, you know, what does round two look like? Thank you, Mayor. We're going to turn to uh, a topic that I think a lot of everyone up on the stage right now wishes they would have had when they were contemplating this, but what's, what's one thing uh, that you wish you would have known when you were starting this program that you can share with everyone out here that's going to stand up one of these programs in their community, whether it's county, city, town? Uh, but uh, let's just stay down at that end, Mayor, and come this way. Sure. So um, our first item, I mentioned Deanna earlier, uh, in addition to serving on the county council, she's also a realtor. And so uh, she is set on our panel, um, our board interviews, which has actually been really good. Uh, I'll give her kudos. She is not plugging her realtor business, um, but is instead really offering that advice and that counsel on how to find a living, a place to live. As many of you, I'm sure, especially in smaller communities, and that's really my lens to view this whole program from, is what do you do with them, right? We, we had a lot of discussion about you're just in increasing the housing price because you're bringing someone who makes twice as much money as the normal citizen. No, we want them to purchase homes in our community. So finding them a place or having an agreement worked out maybe with like an apartment complex in your community um, to maybe just do short three month leases, hold two or three units for them, um, I think would really help accelerate the move rate. Um, I, was, I was cautiously optimistic that we would find five individuals to move to our community. Once we found the first three and the, pa the ink was dry on the paper and we were really making progress, it really became a struggle to find them a home that they wanted, could afford um, in the market we're in. If we had had the opportunity to slot them into a three month lease at an apartment, um, I think that would have been incredibly helpful. Um, we actually did have all four of our families, um, our Three have purchased homes. One is currently renting right now. We were really pushing for home purchase. I think that's a key important. It really helps them buy into your community, much less transient. But getting over that hurdle uh, has been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, for us, housing is definitely um, an issue as well um, in, in Muncie. So um, I did it a little differently. I, so I, I contacted three of the largest real estate companies in, um, in Muncie, and I explained to them what the program was. I said, I am not going to refer to an individual realtor. Uh, I would like f to go directly to each of you on a rotating basis. You pass it out to your realtor. So that's how we handled that part. Uh, but we have a number of people that are not able to find housing um, and so I would encourage all of you to, to come up, if this, the, the finding temporary housing portion is very, very important. Uh, and so the reason we have six that haven't moved in is because they can't, they haven't found a place that will do the temporary housing. In Muncie, we have one community, one apartment community that allows short term. Um, and that's, uh, so that becomes a challenge. Uh, for us, something else we noticed is that uh, once we announced the program, and, and by the way, I was much more aggressive than 10. 10 has been our result so far. I, I signed, I have 45. That's what, we, that's what our initial goal is, uh, and that will, but that will not be our final goal. Uh, but that's what our initial goal is. Uh, but what we found, once we announced the program, we were reached out to at City Hall by several people who had either just moved, uh, two from Chicago and some from other areas, and said, hey, we'd love to find out who these people are. We'd love to connect with them. So we created a networking group uh, for the remote workers. So that's something else you might consider. And then we connected them to our um, some of our, our our technology companies, so to speak, mostly their software companies that are headquartered in Muncie, uh, just to give a, a connection and a feel for the community. Uh, but for us, the housing was the, the biggest issue. Um, and we're a very, um, much like Washington, we're a very 50-50 uh, political split. So there was a lot of pol political pushback and, and posturing 
uh, that we had to maneuver through. So, and we will continue to have to do that in Muncie. Um, but that's something you'll want to be aware of. And I think there was good talk earlier about how to, uh, to best work through that. But uh, we've, we've just been thrilled with the program and would encourage all of you to move forward with it. I won't uh, do anything but just echo the, the housing comment. And, you know, short-term housing also means you normally pay a premium with good reason. The, the landlord has to flip that apartment. And so there, there is a premium. They don't get the longer-term rent. So we've done a lot to, to try to facilitate that. I think probably the, the thing that I wish we had understood a little bit better is just how... Uh, even though as a as a group they all are remote workers so there's some there's some similarities there but when you get beyond that i use the term but they're all an in of one and and tony mentioned the 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 word concierge in terms of how we look at that uh, you've really got to go deep with them to understand what it is that that excites them and i think perhaps because some of the things that excite me like sports and music uh, might have come to the top, and those are somewhat easy to get people plugged into. What they were really talking about is, no, we we are specifically interested in being involved in a community that's dedicated to aerospace, or we want to be working with entrepreneurs that are doing, you know, some level of automation or some level of programming. It was very much an in of one, and so there was there was sort of the component of how do you find people that are like-minded. Uh, but the other end of one that was a little bit surprising, and, and, and su I suppose we're learning this simultaneously, simultaneously is we're bringing a number of expats to work at Saab in, in the new facility. Um, in every case, they've got unique health needs. They've got unique educational needs if they have children. And it turns out that, that having crisp and ready answers to all of those is the difference between them saying yes or no. Uh, a person moving here whose spouse has a, needs a, a good oncology program isn't coming if that answer can't be something that they feel comfortable with. So, um, you know, when we had three or four or five, it, 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 that was not as big of a chore. But when we began to scale that, and now we've got 30 ends of one plus, if they have a household that came with them, um, we, we have really put a lot of effort into that because we want the stickiness, the retention of them, we know hinges on their uh, not only feeling like they can work in this community, but that they enjoy their life here. And so that is something that we spend every, every single day thinking about how do we find the unique thing. Some of that we experiment with, some of it it is just based on feedback that we get from the individuals. But that's something that uh, I, I probably didn't have my head fully around at the beginning. Thanks, Greg. Well, from our regional perspective, I would say, of course, ditto on housing. Everybody hears that. I would say our audience has turned out to be probably three subcomponents. One is uh, the boomerang population, the folks who've moved away, and uh, hear about the pro of program from a friend or a family member who's still at home, and they decide it's time to come back home. This this helps put them over the edge. So we've had we had a fellow uh, ex marine uh, decide to move back from Costa Rica and bring his family to Orange County, as an example. Second group we've got are the folks who um, are new hires by employers in the region. We've let our employers advertise this as being part of their incentive package to get folks to move in from out of state to take jobs. So uh, one of our school systems brought in two teachers using this program. And then the third component is the, um, it is the remote worker. And I think the lesson learned is we, began without really understanding what our value proposition was going to be above and beyond the $5,000. Uh, and we've learned from listening to them what they're seeking is a place where they believe uh, there's a community, a safe place. That's why they're looking in a rural area. The kinds of questions we get are things like, uh, can my kids ride their bikes in the community? Are the schools good? Uh, is it safe there? Uh, how big are yards? Uh, so it, it's it's folks who are looking to get away from something as much as I think probably looking to come to something. Uh, we've had a fair number, a high percent, well, a relatively high percentage who are actually single moms, folks who maybe are trying to start over and want a place where they can settle in the community and feel good about uh, engaging in their kids' uh, 
education growing up, talking to the schools. The biggest thing that I wish we would have known about the program is um, something that really everybody's kind of hint, hinted on, which is the, the retention of these folks. Um, it's not enough to attract them here, we have to keep them here. Um, and uh, as an example, out of our first cohort of 10, um, we had a couple folks end up leaving um, and we had no idea they left. That's how disconnected we were to them. One person uh, used to live in downtown Seattle and they wanted to live in downtown Bloomington and thought that um, it was gonna be very similar just in a smaller town. And it was, um, it was a completely different planet and, uh, and, and they just couldn't get embedded in the community. And had we, uh, we kind of um, induce people to make friends with each other and, um, and kind of get them more embedded in the community and more engaged, we would have found out about that a lot sooner. Um, uh, the other thing I would mention is the, the remote worker networking group is huge. You already have a ton of remote workers living in your community. Um, um, and so it behooves you to build that infrastructure to retain those folks who are already living there. Uh, for, for us, we started off, I think we had like five people at the first one. We've got 30 to 50 that show up each time. It's the only event that we run where when we take an RSVP count, we know that we're gonna, uh, uh, more people who are gonna attend than who RSVP. We're still in this day and age of COVID where if we get 50 RSVPs to an event, we may get 10 to 20 people who actually attend. This is the opposite where we just attract more people as they hear about it. And so um, RSVP, RSVP count is always off, uh, but in a good way. Thanks, Pat. At this point, I think we've got a few minutes. I've uh, got some time to take maybe uh, two or three questions. So I've got to see a qu hand up in the back right or even one up here front, and we'll come to you. Uh, you talked about recruiting. I just wondered what that looked like. <laughs> I mean, as far as how do you uh, go about the recruiting piece? Make my, do, make my Move handles most of the initial. They, I don't know how they handle it with the others. I assume you have a system, everybody follows the same system. So they will send an email to us and says this person has gone through that initial vetting portion. And then we have one dedicated person, I'm the backup. We have one dedicated person, my communications director, who makes all those initial phone calls. And they, at, in those phone calls, they're saying, hey, we understand you're interested. You've been through the first steps here. Uh, we'd love to have you move to our community. Tell me about yourself. So we try and engage them. Um, and then based on that engagement, we have a series of different videos we send out. We, Muncie is fortunate. We have Ironman every year. We have a lot of trails. Um, we have a great reservoir. If somebody's very involved in wanting to ride bikes or run or those kind of things, we might send this video. If they say they want to be downtown in that conversation, we'll send them something about downtown. Uh, if they say they want to know, uh, somebody had made a, had made a question about, um, uh, Af uh, we, we, Muncie has 120 Afghan refugees, that, uh, that we have 120 people that moved to Muncie from the Afghan refugee program. We, we will often send that if somebody's asking about the type of community that we are. Well, we're a very loving and open community. Uh, and uh, so we have a group of videos that we, I paid for and we put together that we send to them based on that conversation. And then we do continual follow-up. But Make My Move does all the initial. Uh, and they send us who are applicants interested because our list is not as high as some of the others, but we may have had 700 applications and it got vetted down to where maybe 40 or 50 came to us. And then we worked the, with the 40 or 50 and came up with 10 that said, yes, we want to move there. And they did that paperwork. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sales process. And um, fortunately for us, I think that was my background before being mayor. And so we just kind of pepper them. With, with, what their with what their interests are. I don't know about the rest of you. Good afternoon, Stacy Morata from the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. My question is twofold. Number one, are you targeting certain geographics or certain industries? And number two, how are you going about that targeted approach? Because I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. <laughs> 
Um, so for us, we do not target specific geographics. Um, so it's really all over the U.S. I think we've gotten uh, applicants from uh, not all 50 states, but like 40 of the 50 states. We've got applicants from 20, 20 or so countries. We've relocated some folks from uh, Mexico and Costa Rica so far. Um, um, uh, so it, it, it ranges pretty widely. Uh, in terms of the types of folks that we end up attracting, um, uh, because we're uh, because it's a co-working space primarily for startups, we attract a lot of um, tech folks. So uh, we've attracted somebody who works for Google, Washington Post, who works on their email marketing side. We've attracted a, a former tech CEO out of Austin who raised money in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of tech folks, including a, a YouTuber who is our by far our number one um, salary. So she raises the average quite a bit. Um, so it's really kind of a, a lot of tech folks. The, the other thing that we're really looking for is just um, um, just really cool, smart people doing interesting things. We want to collect them all at the mill. We know that smart people want to hang around with smart people, so the more folks that we get, the more of a flywheel that effect it creates. Um, one of the folks that we recruited, um, and she is a former youth pastor uh, who's now a professional writer, uh, who's a comedian and also divorced. That's like this kind of, this interesting personality uh, fits Bloomington so well and is just the type of person that is already embedded in the community um, and we really love having her, uh, love having her here. Pat, can I just have one? Stacy, the, the only uh, geographic stipulation we have is we don't recruit from inside the state of Indiana. We don't want to be accused of raiding our fellow communities. I would uh, just add, I mean, I think the comments that Pat made would be similar to what I would say about West Lafayette, Lafayette area. Um, but I would, I would also tell you that um, as we begin to get some publicity around this, I think there's, there, there may be some new focus in the future because the number of Purdue alumni that had a good experience in Indiana but now live elsewhere that read about the program suddenly said, you know what, I... I'm now a remote worker. I wasn't before the pandemic. Now I am. We're thinking about a different, a different life. We had a good, a good time when we were at Purdue, whether it was here for, for undergrad or grad school. So I think as we go forward, perhaps you would think that would just be obvious, uh, but, but in the first phases of this, predominantly it was tech and people that wanted to be in a community of like-minded people that were advancing technology now as we look at this, I think we're going to see an influx of others that have had some form of Purdue affinity in the past. So um, hopeful that that's a new wave of interest going forward. One, one comment really quickly on that, and it's been mentioned, but I want to stress it. And I was glad to hear it talked about earlier. The out-of-state attraction has to be a part of your program, please. Because as a smaller community, there are people in this room who have way more buying power than I do. But there are people smaller than I am that I don't want to take from them either. So please, please, please put an emphasis on out-of-state attraction because it truly helps all of us. We have an individual who's an, um, of Indian descent and he travels to Greenwood, uh, Mayor Myers is here, to shop at the Indian grocery store, but he lives in our community. So that's good for us, it's good for them, it helps everyone. So please keep that in mind um, as an important piece all up and down the food chain. All right, well I just wanna thank everyone today, the panelists, thank you for your time. Make my move, thank you for this opportunity to share today. Please keep in mind that we're gonna win together. So everyone is a resource for you from Mike to everyone up on the stage and everyone in this room. Thanks again. <laughs>